Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 44, Apollo Program Flight 8, Apollo 14, Shepard Back in the Saddle. Last time, we talked about the harrowing flight of Apollo 13. The third attempt at a piloted landing on the moon reverted to survival mode when an oxygen tank and the service module exploded 58 hours into the flight. What followed was the stuff of spaceflight legend, with creative solutions, scary moments, and a Hollywood ending. The mission reminded both NASA and the world that Apollo existed right on the edge of what was possible for humans to achieve, and sometimes strayed over that edge. As part of the immediate response to the accident, a number of changes were made to the spacecraft. First of all, the oxygen tank clearly needed a redesign. The Teflon insulation used inside the oxygen tanks that had caught on fire was replaced by stainless steel. With nothing to burn, it should be impossible to have a repeat accident. The heaters were replaced with lower power models, and everything was updated to run at the correct voltage. They also added a third oxygen tank that was connected to the system through different plumbing as a redundant backup. Just to be extra sure, the tank was placed in a different bay of the service module. Also added to the service module was a large battery that could buy the crew time if the fuel cells were out of commission. On top of that, more instrumentation and cockpit readouts were added to be a little more granular about the status of the all-important fuel cells. Inside of the command module, a number of plastic containers were added to the equipment list, so that if the CM needed to be shut down again, the drinking water could be drained into the bags where it wouldn't freeze. The fixes that followed the Apollo 13 accident were straightforward and effective. The spacecraft modifications were approved within a few months, and there would not be another oxygen tank explosion or another need to shut down the command module. When presented with a clear goal with a measurable outcome, NASA excelled as always. But as we will learn time and time again, it isn't the simple clear-cut stuff that gets you. It's the stuff that you didn't know you didn't know. What NASA did know was that the clock was ticking on lunar surface operations. After peaking in 1967, the space agency's budget began to shrink. What seemed to be the beginning of a magnificent future in space began to look more and more like a false start. Instead of focusing on next-generation propulsion or how to get to Mars, NASA was focusing on how to make the most of an Apollo program that was rapidly shrinking in scope. Apollo wasn't the end, though. Around this time, a lot of work was being done on future projects, specifically Skylab, the Apollo-Soyuz test project, and the space shuttle. We'll be talking extensively about the shuttle in episodes to come, but it's interesting to note that despite not flying for 10 more years, engineers were already hard at work on the project. Requirements needed to be locked down, and contractors needed to be chosen. There was also talk about using the upcoming shuttle to build a space station out of modular pieces. Maybe they could even get other countries to contribute some modules. Hey, such a space station made with international cooperation sounds like an idea with legs. But we are getting way off track here. Let's get our head back in 1971. Apollo 14 was headed to the moon. In fact, it was headed to the Fra Mauro Highlands, the destination of Apollo 13. Actually, other than some minor tweaks, much of the mission would be the same as that planned for 13. I don't mean to detract from something as momentous as a lunar landing, and I could be mistaken about this, but I believe this might be the first ever American spaceflight that wasn't pushing into uncharted waters. Okay, maybe Apollo 13 was the first mission that planned to do that, but as we know, that mission turned out a little different than expected. Each flight in Project Mercury built on the previous one to push the envelope of NASA's experience in space. Project Gemini was explicitly created to test new techniques and equipment in preparation for Apollo. And up until this point in Apollo, each flight had been one steady step after another on the way to the lunar surface. But by Apollo 14, all of the tricky stuff had been accomplished. NASA already had dusty boots, precision landings, and even a legitimate emergency under their belt, and the more advanced stuff was still around the corner. This may make it sound like I'm calling Apollo 14 a boring flight, but actually far from it. In a sense, I think you could call it the first operational flight of the Apollo program. We had figured out how to do the job, and now it was time to get some work done. And that's actually pretty cool. It gives me a vision of an alternate history where there were dozens of lunar landings, and some were allowed to fade into obscurity. 
not ready to fade into obscurity was a crew that was more than ready to fly. Originally slated for Apollo 13, bumped to Apollo 14 through a stroke of good luck, and then forced to wait a further eight months during the accident investigation, this crew had been training for a long time. Allow me to introduce the crew of Apollo 14, Commander Alan Shepard, Command Module Pilot Stu Rusa, and Lunar Module Pilot Ed Mitchell. Alan Shepard? THE Alan Shepard? The one who became America's first astronaut during the 15-minute flight of Freedom 7? Just where the heck has that guy been, anyway? And it turns out, the bench. We last saw Shepard on the suborbital flight of Mercury Redstone 3, commonly known as Freedom 7, back on May 5th, 1961. We covered it here way back in episode 3. His brief mission proved that a human could survive such a flight, and that a pilot could operate his vehicle in space, which the Russians had yet to prove, opening the door to the other flights in Project Mercury. He actually almost flew in Mercury again as part of the sort-of-planned Mercury Atlas 10, which Shepard creatively dubbed Freedom 7-2. It would have really pushed the Mercury hardware to the limits by spending a whopping three days in orbit, but with Faith 7 being such a success and Gemini on the horizon, Freedom 7-2 was relegated to a historical footnote. Alright, so that explains Mercury, but what about Gemini? In 1963, right as Shepard was preparing to fly the first Gemini mission, he started experiencing bouts of crippling vertigo, accompanied by loud noises in his ear. At first, he tried to ignore the issue, hoping that it would go away, out of fear that it would compromise his flight status. But eventually it got to the point that it would just be too dangerous to try to go on, and Shepard dragged himself to the doctor. The news was not good. Alan Shepard, America's first spaceman, was suffering from an inner ear disorder called Meniere's disease. It's caused by a buildup of fluid inside part of the inner ear, and can lead to vertigo, dizziness, temporary hearing loss, tinnitus, and the constant feeling that you need to pop your ears. It's a pretty awful affliction for anyone, but for a pilot it was nearly a death sentence. For the second time, a member of the Mercury 7 was grounded for medical reasons. But Shepard didn't give up, and he continued to work on potential solutions to his problem even as he moved on to his new role, Chief of the Astronaut Office, working under his fellow medical status-afflicted colleague, Deke Slayton. And that's where he would remain for the next six years. In 1969, he underwent a new treatment for Meniere's disease, which involved delicately cutting open part of his inner ear in order to install a shunt, which would allow excess fluid to drain. It was not without risk and could have damaged his ear permanently. But fortune favors the bold, and the treatment was successful. Alan Shepard was placed back on flight status in May 1969 and immediately got to work. He was originally supposed to command Apollo 13, despite the fact that Gordon Cooper was in line for that role. But Deke Slayton didn't feel like Cooper was taking his training seriously. NASA management was concerned about Shepard's six years on the bench and thought he could use a little more training, however, so he and his crew were bumped from 13 to Apollo 14. I tried to think of something to say here about fairness and cosmic justice and how it applies to stuff like the astronaut corps, but I couldn't really come up with anything. So let me just say that I'm really glad that after six years of waiting, Alan Shepard didn't end up on Apollo 13. This was his second and final flight. Joining Shepard on the surface was LMP Ed Mitchell. Edgar Dean Mitchell was born on September 17, 1930 in Hereford, Texas. Like most of the Apollo-era astronauts, he followed a pretty typical trajectory to NASA. He was a Boy Scout, went to Carnegie Mellon where he studied industrial management, and joined the Navy. He attended the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School and received a degree in aeronautics and then studied astronautics at MIT. He flew various aircraft with the Navy before becoming a test pilot and instructor. Along the way, he was actually involved in managing aspects of the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. NASA scooped him up as part of Astronaut Group 5 in 1966. Now, perhaps this isn't completely fair to a guy with a distinguished flying career and who would become the sixth man to walk on the moon, but I can't talk about Ed Mitchell without mentioning that he was sort of a nut. 
He was a big believer in all sorts of paranormal stuff like ESP, remote healing, and UFOs. If you ever see a news story with an Apollo astronaut talking about UFOs, I guarantee you it's Ed Mitchell. And this wasn't something he took lightly. On the way back from the moon, he conducted ESP experiments, where at specific times he'd focus hard on a thought and people on the ground would try to receive them. Oh, and in case there was any doubt, two years after this flight, he founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which is basically a school for psychics. So yeah, Ed Mitchell, kooky guy. This was his first and only flight. Rounding up the crew was Command Module Pilot Stu Rusa. Stuart Rusa was born on August 16, 1933, in Durango, Colorado. He studied aeronautical engineering at the University of Boulder, and then followed a somewhat similar career path to Mitchell, but joined the Air Force instead of the Navy. He served in a variety of roles focusing on test flying and aircraft maintenance before becoming a test pilot at Edwards, where he soon joined NASA as part of Astronaut Group 5. Perhaps more than others, he understood the risks of spaceflight, as he was Capcom on the day of the Apollo 1 fire, trying in vain to re-establish communications with the crew. If the usual crew rotations had held, and if the later missions weren't cancelled, there's a chance he would have commanded Apollo 20. Instead, this was his only spaceflight. After years of waiting, the crew of Apollo 14 finally crawled aboard their spacecraft on January 31, 1971. The countdown experienced no significant issues except for the weather. With the thunder from Apollo 12's lightning strike still rumbling in the heads of mission controllers, the Saturn V was restrained until the weather cleared. At 4.03 p.m., 40 minutes and 3 seconds late, the rocket was unleashed and Apollo 14 was underway at last. That extra 40 minutes and 3 seconds was a bit of a problem, though. While most crew activities had a fair amount of play in the timeline, engine burns did not. Plus, the moon would now be in a different place when they arrived. To fix this, the translunar injection burn was slightly longer, making the trek to lunar orbit 40 minutes faster. But this meant that all the events that were based on the spacecraft clock would be off by 40 minutes. The solution was to pull a sort of mini daylight saving time and fast forward the clock on the spacecraft by 40 minutes and 3 seconds. The change wasn't made until 3 days into the mission, and I have no idea why, but this whole thing was confusing enough already, so I just let it drop. Ascent proceeded smoothly, with some final hardware tweaks seemingly defeating the pogo oscillation problem once and for all. The now slightly longer TLI was performed with no issues, and Apollo 14 was on its way to the moon. Next up, of course, was transposition and docking. Since I haven't really spelled this out in a while, this is the process where the command and service modules pop off the top of the third stage, the S4B, they float out a ways, turn around, come back, and put the docking probe of the command module into a conical drogue on the lunar module. With CMP Stu Rusa at the controls, command module Kitty Hawk made its way towards lunar module Antares. The docking probe slid into place, the latches caught, and... wait, the latches didn't catch. Hmm. Alright, well, try it again. Still, the latches didn't catch. Over five attempts at increasing velocities, the latches just would not catch. We better take a closer look at how the docking probe works. On the tip of the probe are three latches, whose job it is to grab the lem and hold it in place for the next phase of docking. When the three latches snap into place, it's known as soft dock. After soft dock, the probe is retracted, pulling the lem closer, until another set of latches arrayed around the docking tunnel can snap into receptacles on the lem. Once these latches are in place, the state is known as hard docked, and the tunnel can now be pressurized. What was happening here was that Kitty Hawk was unable to soft dock with Antares. This could be caused by any number of things and probably resulted in a number of I told you so's on the ground, since the Apollo docking system was widely known to be a mechanical nightmare. Maybe a pin hadn't been removed from the latches, maybe some water had worked its way in there and frozen, or some debris had somehow gotten stuck in there. It could be anything, there was just no way of knowing. What was known was that this was a big, big deal. Without a docking, Apollo 14 would not be landing on the moon. 
and while they wouldn't arrive at the moon for three days, the S-4B only had a few more hours where it could hold its attitude before the batteries failed, and it began to drift freely. I shudder to think what NASA would look like today if it had experienced two lunar landing failures in a row. As Alan Shepard started formulating a plan for an unauthorized EVA to try to fix the probe, really that was his plan, they tried one last idea. For a sixth time, Russo backed Kitty Hawk off and came at Antares. This time when they touched, he continued to fire the RCS thrusters and flipped the switches to retract the docking probe, skipping directly to hard dock. I wish I could have seen the look on Alan Shepard's face when he heard the clacking of all the latches snapping into place. Not only was the hard dock a success, but the three latches at the front of the probe also drove home. Later inspection of the probe was unable to determine what could have caused the issue, but it seemed to be gone now. There was still a chance that there would be some difficulty redocking after ascending from the lunar surface, but at that point the LEMS roll would be done, and Shepard and Mitchell could return to the CSM by performing an emergency EVA. Not ideal, but doable. After the more stressful than planned transposition and docking, the flight out to the moon proceeded smoothly. Which is good, because I'm sure Alan Shepard needed some time to calm down. After getting this far and making such an unlikely comeback, he wasn't about to let anything stop him from setting foot on the lunar surface. About 82 hours into the mission, the service propulsion system fired up, did its thing, and dropped Kitty Hawk and Antares into their initial lunar orbit. Four hours later, it dropped the lowest point in its orbit to about 10.5 miles above the surface, removing the need for the descent orbit insertion burn normally performed by the LEM. As discussed a couple of episodes back, this saved fuel for the LEM, allowing for a few more moments of precious hover time. The next day, Shepard and Mitchell hopped aboard Antares, leaving Rusa to keep things under control in Kitty Hawk, and preparations began for the descent to the surface. The two spacecraft undocked, with Kitty Hawk circularizing its orbit shortly afterwards. Preparations were going smoothly until suddenly, ground controllers noticed something odd. In the downlinked telemetry, a bit was set that indicated that the computer thought an abort had been commanded. If this had happened during the landing, that would have been it. The LEM would have immediately aborted the mission. Depending on how far into the descent this happened, it either would have turned around and returned to orbit, or the descent propulsion system would have cut out, the LEM would have staged, and the ascent propulsion system would have kicked in. No landing on the moon. Capcom Fred Hayes, hey, we know that guy, asked LMP Ed Mitchell to try tapping on the control panel in the area near the abort switch. The bit cleared. Problem solved. Ex except no. Not too long after that, the bit returned. They tapped again, it went away again, and it came back again. It seemed that a tiny piece of metal, likely a solder ball, had come loose inside the switch and was just randomly drifting around, sometimes triggering the switch. This was obviously no good. They couldn't attempt a landing and just hope that the switch wouldn't close. Houston called up MIT, the creators of the guidance software, and software engineer Don Isles got one of the most intense bug fix calls in history. There are two guys in orbit around the moon. You need to figure out how to prevent this switch from accidentally ending the mission. Oh, and you need to figure it out, write it, test it, and relay it to the astronauts in two hours. Good luck! But it turns out that they don't just let any scrub write software for spaceships. The men and women of the MIT software team knew what they were doing. Isles figured it out in time, and the instructions were relayed to the crew. Here's how it worked. The computer had a flag called Let Abort that indicated if the vehicle should be permitted to abort the landing. The astronauts could manually override the flag, but the computer would put the flag back 0.2 seconds after engine ignition. The initial solution was to have Ed Mitchell enter the flag clearing command as fast as possible after ignition and just hope that the abort switch behaved itself during those few brief seconds. In order to reset the flag, Mitchell would need to use the disky, the computer interface, to input verb 25, noun 7, enter, 105, enter, 400, enter, 1, enter. Oh, and don't make any typos. Thankfully, while Antares was on the backside of the moon, MIT thought of something better that didn't involve such a scary race condition. 
It turns out that the abort routine would check a specific piece of computer memory, called the mode register, to see what program was running. If the currently running program was already one of the two abort programs, then it wouldn't initiate another abort. So the new plan was to manually set the register to program 71, the stage and abort program, which would trick the routine into thinking the mission had already been aborted. Then, after ignition, clear the let abort flag, which made it safe to return the mode register back to P63, the landing program. One further wrinkle in all of this was that the abort routine wouldn't be the only thing that was tricked. The program that ran upon engine ignition would also be confused. So the engine wouldn't throttle up after 26 seconds, and the automated guidance wouldn't take over. Shepard would have to manually throttle the engine up, and Mitchell would have to set the flag while the engine was burning. Oh, and if an abort was actually necessary, they'd need to make it on the AGS, the backup guidance system, while Mitchell manually put the PINGS, the primary guidance system, back into its normal state. So the entire sequence went something like this. Shepard would turn Antares to the burn attitude and activate program 63. Mitchell would load program 71 into the mode register, making other routines think that program 71 was running. After the engine started burning, Mitchell would set the let abort flag to false. After 26 seconds, Shepard would manually throttle up the DPS engine. Mitchell would then set zoom flag, the flag that allows automatic control, to true. Mitchell would then reset let abort again, I'm not sure why, but this was maybe just to be extra safe. And lastly, Mitchell would load program 63 back into the mode register, and Shepard would throttle down, allowing the computer to take over again. As a software guy, I have to say that this is pretty amazing. The level of system knowledge necessary to be able to hack around in the LEM computer like this on such short notice borders on the miraculous. NASA was lucky to have such a dedicated team at MIT and one of the best lunar module pilots available flying the vehicle. Even if he was a little nuts. Despite all of the complexity and all of the moving parts, this plan actually worked. Antares initiated power descent and no abort calls were issued. Every Apollo mission seems to get some kind of crazy wrench thrown into the works to make things interesting, and between the docking issues and the abort switch, it looked like Apollo 14 had had its fair share. The rest of the descent should go nice and smoothly. Except, hang on a second, the landing radar is on the fritz. The landing radar, the device that provides the all-important altitude and velocity data? Ugh, what's next? Next is... next time. Will they fix the landing radar? Will Alan Shepard and Ed Mitchell get to walk on the moon? Will Ed Mitchell's alien buddies intervene to help him out? Tune your podcast to this frequency in two weeks to hear the exciting conclusion. I just wanted to take a quick moment here at the end to once again say thanks so much for listening and to remind everyone that the main way I pick up new listeners is by word of mouth. So if you've been enjoying the show and think you know someone else who might like it too, consider giving them a heads up. Also, stuff like leaving an iTunes rating and review helps a ton, or so I'm told. For those of you who have already been doing all that, thank you. It's super awesome, and I really do appreciate it. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.